Welcome back to Lily High on Life with another really special guest in our studio today. And our guest today is Robert Wheel. Robert, welcome. Hi, Lily. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for being a guest on Lily High on Life so we can get to know you a little more. Looking forward. (laughs) I hope so. Now, one of the reasons, or a few of the reasons I wanted you on the show is I've actually known you forever. Um, We both grew up in Melbourne. Um, I went to Beth Rifka Ladies College. I went to Yeshiva and I used to climb the fence just to grab a peek at you. (laughs) And the other girls in the class there. The girls generally. And you've always just been such a nice guy. So that's that's always a good thing. But also the reason you're on here is because you really are quite a conundrum of, of different things. You're an accountant by trade. Accountants are usually a little... Uh, lay back and boring, if I yes, can characterize. They say, yes, yeah, there's uh, the old joke um, what do accountants use as a contraceptive, their personality? <laughs> And which brings us to the other thing. You're also a professional comedian. You've performed on stage, not just in Australia, but internationally. Yes, performed uh, many continents in Israel, United States, Asia, um, Sydney. <laughs> And you have a great, I mean, your humor is, is really excellent. You, I've, I've had many occasions where I just could not stop laughing. You're just so naturally funny. Uh, thank you. Um, something I've always enjoyed is studying other comedians. I never thought that I would become one. Um, interesting story. You probably want to hear how I, I do a want to hear, actually. So it all started back in about 1994 when my son's school that he attended, Libley Avner College here in Melbourne, decided to have a comedy night as a fundraiser. And it was actually a very funny night and it was uh, it was sort of a, um, a, panel, a contrived panel discussion about bar mitzvahs and the, the, the topic was um, bar mitzvah is $55 a head enough. <laughs> And there were four couples uh, as part of the panel. So there was a an Israeli couple with a uh, an Israeli husband, a very jappy wife. Uh, play, the husband was played by Eddie Tamir. And there was myself. Uh, I adopted this character of Rabbi Morty Katz, sort of a uh, of quite a from American rabbi with a very frumpy looking wife. I won't tell you who played the <laughs> wife. Okay. And then there was a sort of a new age couple. Um, uh, you know, sort of greeny, a greeny new age couple, and, and then there was another couple. I can't remember what the other two were, but anyway. And uh, so I adopted this character, Robert Morty Katz, and um, Eddie Tamir and I had never met before, but uh, we sort of both got on very well, and we decided to um, do a little bit of comedy entertainment, and we prepared some skits. Based on my character as the as the New York rabbi and him as the Israeli secular Israeli, and how we interacted with each other, and we performed quite a few of these all over the place. We're in big demand, and uh, after. So you perform. So the first time you performed, you got such a great reaction. It became addictive, or just people wanted to see more uh, and more. People of you? wanted to see more of us, and so we developed a few other storylines. I mean, the main one was that we were on our way to Israel, and there was a plane breakdown on Alitalia, and we got stuck together in Rome and had to share a hotel room, and that was the uh, story. And um, anyway, so Eddie eventually went into the cinema ownership business as you probably know mm-hmm. and uh, and he puts on the Jewish film festival every year that and yeah it does a wonderful job with the, at the classic and uh, so that I thought that was the end of my career but then people kept uh, calling me and saying could you come and entertain here and do this uh, dinner and this bar mitzvah and all this sort of thing and I wasn't very keen but I thought I'll give it a go and uh, I was sort of that was quite successful and um, comedy is actually a really tough thing to do because you're up there on your own or even with a partner, but it takes a lot of guts. To that's what I love about it. I love the challenge. I really love the challenge. So there was a comedy competition in New York at the Stand Up New York Comedy Club, 
and it was the world's funniest rabbi competition and my wife encouraged me to go and enter it <laughs> and I thought she was joking but she said no 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 she I really mean it why don't you go and enter it give it a go so off I flew to New York and pretended I was a real rabbi and uh, and I won the competition how absolutely fantastic it was great so it was um, it was all it was telecast on the comedy channel in America so that was a great uh, felt it was a great feather in my cap and the very interesting part was that one of the judges was a guy called Aaron Leppenwall who owned the famous Second Avenue Deli in mm-hmm. New York very famous uh, very famous with showbiz people who love to eat there <laughs> And uh, he came up to me afterwards and he said, I love your stuff, what you do, you're so unique. He said, I can get you a lot of work here in the States. And I got very excited about that. So we promised to keep in touch. And you wouldn't believe it, two weeks after that, poor Mr. Lebanwall was murdered. He was um, (laughs) mugged, taking the takings to the bank. Oh, my God. From his restaurant one night, he was mugged and shot. And so that was the end of my uh, immediate comedy career in America. And Remind that's not a a there was a famous uh, Woody Allen film, Bullets Over Broadway. I sort of felt that that was made about my career. <laughs> so um, how did it feel to, to actually go to America and participate? Were you nervous? Were you looking at it as uh, just a fun thing to do? Uh, a bit of both. I was a bit nervous. I certainly didn't expect to win. Um, there was one guy there who I thought was really funny, and I was sure he was going to win. He was some reform rabbi. And uh, when I won, he wasn't very magnanimous about it at all, actually. <laughs> he wasn't. I think he was a bit chuffed that uh, I pipped him at the post. But anyway, it was great. And then, the, f- the fact that you'd get up and actually go and actually do it, not just think about it, is amazing. And one of the great things about Lily High on Life, we're all about people going for what they want to do rather than being scared off from Certainly one of the highlights of my life, definitely. And so um, you did, you, and, and on top of being a comedian and your background in accounting, you're also an entrepreneur and you've had a business, a family business that you took over and that you've grown over the years as well. Um, entrepreneur or comedian, which one, which one would, you, if you had it, there were no other restrictions, just a choice. Business owner or comedian? Uh, probably a combination of both. I couldn't split them, but I tried to be. Uh, I mean, my, I keep my secretary highly uh, amused in the business. It's, it's a laugh a minute in the office. And how long have you been married? And by the way, I've been married. My secretary has been with me longer than my wife. <laughs> she came as a young girl so about um, 34 years ago, and she's still there. And my wife, uh, we're married, I think, 31 years. Do you, so. And do they both still laugh with you? Uh, my wife doesn't. My secretary does. <laughs> um, so you, um, when you married your wife, was that a long engagement? How did you meet her? Oh, no, very interesting. So my wife is Irish. She's from Belfast. And she lived in Israel for eight years before coming here. And she came here on a working holiday. And uh, we met, uh, I'm just trying to think. Oh, yes, um, what happened was I was a subscriber to the Melbourne Theatre Company. There was a group of us that used to go every month to the plays. And I was um, I started off to, at university and then kept on. And uh, one night one of the girls couldn't come and she gave her ticket to Adele, this Irish girl. And uh, I thought she was really nice. And I, went, I used to go with another friend of mine, a guy, and we were lamenting the lack of female talent around Melbourne, female Jewish talent. And I remember saying to my friend Richard, I said, you know, I haven't met one nice girl since that Irish girl that night at the theatre, and I can't remember her name. And lo and behold, as I said that to him, we were attending a, a function, and she walked in. Bashert. Bashert. And uh, so I got chatting with her again, asked her out, and, um, well, as I say, the rest is history. It is indeed. I love it when stuff like that happens. Yeah. And you really are a romantic. Tell us a little bit about the business that you're in at the moment. Okay, so um, the business is called Specialty Quilts. That's our company name. But our brand name is MicroCloud, microcloudbedding.com.au. 
and uh, it's, it was originally a family business started by my uh, father. So my, my father had the same business in Europe, in Czechoslovakia before the war, and, so, and that was started by his grandfather. So I'm like fourth generation in that type wow. of trade. But uh, when my father came here, you know, the usual story, penniless, and he wanted to start up a business. He didn't have the capital. So my parents came here in 1950, and uh, my father wasn't able to start the business until 1966, uh, when he uh, saved up enough money to buy some machinery and started the business. My mother was involved in the fashion trade quite uh, heavily, and uh, she came into the business in 1969, and then unfortunately in 1970, my father had a, was involved in a very serious car accident. He was run over by a car actually outside Shul on Rosh Hashanah night. Wow. Outside Mizrahi. And uh, he survived it, but uh, he was never the same after that. And uh, everything fell on my mother's shoulders. I was still too young to come into the business. So my mother was quite uh, a hero in that regard. And eventually I came into the business in about 1976 to help out, and I've been there ever since. And that's a pretty devastating thing to happen at such an early age. Do you remember your life before and after? And what was... I mean, that th- you've got no terms of reference for something like that happening. Do you remember what was going through your mind or what you were thinking at the time? Uh, well, I was with him at the time of the accident. I was there, unfortunately. I was lucky to s- not to have been hit myself. Um, well, I was in total shock, of course, and my mother was also in, in total shock. She didn't know where to start. Um, fortunately, her... She had a couple of loyal employees who rallied around to help. Um, but it's certainly, in, in terms of my life, it uh, definitely changed uh, in a split second. How old were you? You were 15. past bar mitzvah, I was 15, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, was, I was still at school and affected my studies in that year, although I sort of made up for it in the following year. Um, what did it sort of do for you as a young boy that was going into adulthood in terms of how you felt about your responsibilities at that time since your dad was taken out of his normal way of life? Well, I knew my responsibilities should have, should have been um, helping my mother as much as possible and, and that, but my mother was insistent that... Uh, uh, I tried not that that was uh, you know one of the uh, wonderful things about her. She was insistent that I not give up my schooling that I had to go to university and um, she would manage but of course uh, I helped as much as I could but uh, it certainly changed my whole uh, perspective on life did it um, did it change what you were thinking of studying or doing or were you always looking at going into accounting or was it I sort of had a dream of doing of becoming a vet because I'm a big animal lover, um, but then I realised that was going to be too difficult, so uh, I changed course uh, in uh, in what is called now year eleven now I think it's called, and uh, switched from sciences to humanities, and um, studied economics and accounting, and that was the. Uh, career I ended up pursuing. So you went into the business while you were still studying and were practically were practically involved with day-to-day uh, running as well? Yeah, I studied full-time for about three years and then part-time um, while I was, when I went into the business. Yeah. And wh- how old were you when your dad passed? Uh, he died in 1988. So I was well, 33, something like that. Right. Yeah. So it was um, you were helping take care of him as well. Yeah. He, he improved up to a point where he became quite independent again, but he was, uh, you know, always very tired, very easily, very unsteady on his feet. But uh, he came back into the business and helped as much as he could. And then tonight is actually the yurt site for your mother, yeah, two years. Yeah, uh, as it turns out, it's the second yurt site tonight. I've just come from shul, actually, saying Kaddish for her. And uh, we'll continue to do that tomorrow. So what was it 
a, we, I mean, we all know that our parents are going to go or should go before us rather than after. But it doesn't matter what age they are when you do lose them. Um, and I ask this question because God bless Bissa Hinden Svonsik for all our parents. But how does it change you when when your mother left as well? Uh, oh, that's a very hard question. Um, it's, uh, to be perfectly, perfectly honest, um, it was a bit of a sense of relief because my mother suffered a lot in the last uh, couple of years. She was dependent on carers and the type of thing. She had Parkinson's disease. And, uh, of course, you know, it's devastating to lose a parent. But on the other hand, I reason she, she lived quite a long time, much longer than the doctors ever expected her to. She was uh, 91, going on 92 when she passed. And, uh, of course, I miss her every day. Um, but um, my life, uh, life goes on. Life goes And yeah. do you still feel her around you as well? Yes, yes. Quite subconscious. Sometimes, uh, you know, something will... Uh, I'll have a thought during the day or I hear a bit of news and I sort of automatically think oh, I should ring up mum and let her know that <laughs> but you come to the realisation very quickly that uh, that's not going to be so and um, so just going back to the business aspect you've stayed uh, you've got into the family business and it's changed a lot from the days when you started it's completely to today. changed so uh, when um, when we started uh, my father as I told you had a, bought, invested in machinery we had a factory at its height we employed about 20 people we used to sell to the big stores to Myers and David Jones and Target and all these sort of people all these ones that are struggling now as it happens and um very difficult. My mother was a super saleswoman. That was her real forte. Um, I can tell you some stories about how she used to win the buyers over. <laughs> I'm sure they're great stories. <laughs> yes. And my father sent my mother to the first big business sales meeting with Woolworths as well I years tell ago. You, so I'll, I'll tell, tell you me a, one a story. quick anecdote. There was a buyer at Myers who she became very friendly with and his family. And in those days, you'd invite them for dinner and all this yes. sort of thing. That doesn't exist today. You can't even... You got to go up to a little office and head office somewhere, and most of them don't even know what they're what they're doing. Mm. And um, so she used to invite them often. She invited them once for Shabbos lunch. Wow! Yeah, and um, my mother served a cholent, a real Hungarian <laughs> cholent, and this fellow, his name was Philip Scoble. He tried the cholent, and he was absolutely taken with it. And after he polished it off, about three helpings. <laughs> He said to my mother, Magda, I have to tell you, that is the best Irish stew I've had in my whole life. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, things are really different. We used to, yes, being, having, coming from a Russian background, we used to take buyers out for a Russian night at the yeah. Russian restaurant and ply them with vodka. So. Yeah, now if you even offer them a coffee or a uh, told by head office that you're trying to bribe them or something. Yeah, and the results are as what they are yeah, retail is struggling. So what was it like making those big changes in a business that your dad started well, when you needed to, to really change the way it, things were going? It got to a point where manufacturing became more and more difficult as, as is a general trend here right throughout Australia and uh, it was just impossible to compete with imports and also a lot of problems with trade unions and that type of thing. So I got to the point where I said, we've got to change it, we've got to turn things around and bit the bullet, mortgaged my house just so I could pay out the redundancies of these uh, workers. Many of them we were, were close with, they were fine people, but I just couldn't afford to keep it going like that. And uh, after I did that, I started subcontracting out to a, uh, actually to a Russian a little family business of uh, quilters. And, uh, and then eventually uh, I realized that um, China's the way to go. 
So that that time when you had to make that decision, where you were really going to make the changes and you knew you were affecting people's lives and you knew you were going in a different direction that was made more sense for you, was it hard to do or it was just, were you pragmatic about it or was there still a homage to what your dad was trying to do? Uh, yeah, no, there was. It was very hard to do. I remember one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life is to call them all together and tell them that uh, this is the end of the road. But don't worry, you're going to get your redundancy pay. But they didn't. I mean, a lot of them had been with us for many years and very loyal, and that. But uh, not much I could do about that. Like your current secretary. Yeah. Did you stay in touch with anyone? A couple of them. Yeah, a couple of them pop in and visit us sometimes. Yeah. And did your wife become more involved in the business? Yes. Soon after we uh, married, um, she got quite involved in the business um, on the selling side. We used to have a, a factory shop. Members of the public would come and sh- and she would run that side of the business and still does now. She's a bit more semi-retired now, but she's still uh, quite involved in that area. And then you went from that contracting side of things to now where a lot of stuff is done in China. Um, that was another big transition decision in going in a new direction? It was a slow transition. We started doing little bits and pieces with China, but then... Um, I uh, collaborated with um, a good friend of mine um, uh, who is very good at marketing and product development. His name is Tony Blanche. And uh, together we uh, developed a whole lot of new products um, under our microcloud brand. that we Such uh, as? Such as high-quality quilts, uh, pillows and toppers, but instead of selling to retailers, we aimed our focus at selling to the hospitality industry, to hotels, mm. which was a lot easier than selling to retailers because I found the hotels had been very poorly serviced with that type of um, thing and they didn't really know where to go. And then how, how the situation developed to what it is today um, we started getting feedback from guests who'd stayed in the hotels and slept on our products and uh, they'd, get in, they'd get in touch with us and say, oh, can we buy these products? You know, it's the best night's sleep I've ever had. These pillows are magnificent. Can we buy them from you? And I said, of course. <laughs> and so then we got uh, our marketing strategy became to putting our, our website um, uh, uh, address on, on every label of every single product in the hotel. Smart. Yeah, so... And I yeah. ask you this not only because it's a development of the business and because you do need to change in business as the times change, but as with the first um, iteration of the new type of business, it's not just, okay, let's go this direction. There are consequences, there are decisions, there are things that affect people, so it's not just, okay, we decided to do this now because it's more profitable it it there, there are big shifts and things that happen at each stage uh, huge shifts it has to be very carefully planned i observe a lot of small businesses who uh, the proprietors have really good ideas and then they launch into it but they don't have a proper business plan and uh and unfortunately, that's where a lot of them fail. And it's not just a business plan, but it's in your own mind when you're making any kind of changes, and especially going into a partnership after being in a family business, that in itself, it's fabulous that it worked out, but that's also fraught with... Uh, yeah, well, we're not actually in a partnership. We, we were quite adamant about that. We wanted to stay friends, so it's more of a strategic alliance where uh, we have separate companies, but we work together with each other. And we've been doing that now for about 15 years. And well, that's a really interesting and sounds like sensible way to go as well. Yes, it's working out well and so far. And you've obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but your wife has been part of all the decision making for each part, each of the changes? Uh, yes, she's, put, she's the encouragement um, more than decision maker, and but I do no, I do bounce a lot of things off her, including my uh, comedy routines as well. <laughs> Does she help you write your comedy? No, she criticises it, and uh, she'll, I'll, I'll come up sometimes with something, and I think this is fantastic. I'm this routine, and she'll say, "No, I don't think that's going to work." But uh, usually, she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Um, your so your what's just give out your business website and do you have a comedy website? 
Uh, yes, so my comedy website is uh, rabbimordicats.com. But it's not uh, very terribly active, but it's there. And our business website is very active. It's got a really great website. It works very well and gets thousands of hits. And that is www.microcloudbedding, or one word, .com.au. Just uh, a week ago, I was in China, in Shanghai, at the Peace Hotel. There's a uh, fantastic uh, jazz club there, and um, it's called the Jazz Room. And all the musicians, like the average age is about 75. They're all these sort of older, wow. older men, but great musicians. And I love, I spent like three hours there, loved it. I was there with friends. And uh, one of the songs they played was that, and I enjoyed it so much. It just uh, reminded me how much uh, I'd forgotten and how much I really enjoyed it. Brought it back into your yeah, presence. Yeah. Well, it kind of makes sense. People would be shocked at Shanghai who have never been there. It really is not just a modern city, but really um, more alive than Melbourne or Sydney. Oh, very much so, especially that area where the, I don't know if you've, have you been there, Lily? Yes, a yeah, number the, of times. The Bund area and where the Peace Hotel is and that, very European in, the, in its feel. Do you still worry about business and life? I worry, I don't worry about my business. Um, I worry about the general economy and the way things are looking in this country and in the world. Um, and I worry about uh, how political correctness has taken over every segment of society. I find it uh, very upsetting and, I've, I, and it's just so overpowering. And as much as I try, and there are others who try, and I know especially people on this radio station, um, it's so hard to fight back against it. But uh, you can't give up the fight because um, if you think about it rationally, it's uh, it's a ruinous situation. Political correctness has gone to such extents that it's almost laughable now. And, uh, and it will be. And part of that also, I know that you are very connected and tied to Israel and to the Jewish community and to the Jewish community here. You're actually the president of a synagogue here in um, Melbourne. I was the president. I'm vice president now of Caulfield uh, Hebrew Congregation, um, which I've had connection there for since childhood. How did that... Um, how, you've had connections since childhood, but to step up and actually take that leadership position, was that uh, something you were pushed into, something well, you wanted to a do? a little bit. Not, not many people are keen to go on shul boards. Um, I was quite keen. I was on the board on and off for about 20 years, um, mainly because I really enjoyed uh, shul life and the meaningfulness of it. <laughs> Um, and then it was inevitable that I would become. I was vice president for a few years, and then I, began, I had a term as president for four years, and now I'm back to being vice president again. So that prioritising um, in your life of community um, is that something that was always ingrained in you? Did you? F- uh, yes. By first of all, um, I went to Yeshiva College all my uh, school life from kindergarten through to matric. Uh, I was very um, influenced by Rabbi Groner. He mm. was uh, the late Rabbi Groner. I found him to be a wonderful mentor. And I was also influenced by my grandparents. And I have to say that uh, I was a rarity in my class, the fact that I had grandparents. Because most of my classmates were children of Holocaust survivors and, and they didn't have their grandparents anymore, unfortunately. So I had my, my mother's father... And his wife, who was actually his his first wife, uh, he lost in the war, but uh, he remarried, and my mother brought them out to Australia, and she was she was like a real grandmother to me, and I was very very close with them. Um, they were very religious, imbued a lot of um, spirituality and uh, meaningfulness of religion into my life. So combined with that and Yeshiva College, um, I find Yiddishkeit very important, a very important aspect of my life. And how many times have you been to Israel? Oh, probably about 14 or 15 times, yeah. And the synagogue... 
is it for you or as family community thing do you uh, do you have close your some of your closest friends part of the synagogue or is it an addition yeah, it's a lot of our circle of friends are connected with the synagogue and our uh, um, a lot of our life is based around the synagogue and also we're a very small family it's only in Australia at least so there's only uh, me and my wife and my son who's no longer in Australia is now living in New York um, so the synagogue is a very important aspect of our life and I, I always say that I wish more people um, felt part of a community and belonged to a synagogue mm. um, than what is the case at the moment I think it's you're right in that it's really important and not enough people are connected, including myself. I mean, I've always been very Jewish, but I've never belonged to a synagogue coming out of Russia. It wasn't the norm for us, and so it wasn't what the yeah. family did. I think in this day and age it's very important um, to, to belong to a community. And uh, I, I read a very interesting um, little adage saying that, uh, that uh, and what, what I want to say is that it's very important um, that it comes from the home. Definitely. And the adage that I read, which is so true, it says when, uh, when Judaism is based around the synagogue, the synagogues are empty. When Judaism is based around the home, the synagogues are full. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Um, are you also involved in other organizations or aspects of the community? Um, I'm involved with now through my comedy. I do a lot of uh, I do a lot of fundraising. Um, I'm very involved with uh, Karen Malky, the Israeli charity that's um, uh, started by Arnold Roth and his wife. You know the whole story. I guess yes. your listeners would know. And in fact, uh, Arnold's daughter was one of the victims at the Sabora pizza tragedy when a terrorist came right. and blew the place up. And I regularly appear whenever I'm in Israel at the uh, comedy club in Jerusalem. It's called Off the Wall. And uh, at least uh, once every two years, um, I make it a fundraiser for Karen Malky, and we get a lot of people in, and we've raised quite a few thousand dollars over the years for Karen Malky. Very nice. With your comedy, do things just occur to you and you jot them down, or do you take the time on a regular basis to sit down and write new stuff? Uh, lately, I don't write much new stuff or rely on a lot of my old stuff, but uh, I'm very into observational humour. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of, there's two comedians that I love watching and they inspire me. And that's where I get a lot of my ideas from and I adapt them. So one of them is Barry Humphreys. Love I'm Barry Absolutely Humphreys. besotted with. He's coming back again. I'm going, I've got tickets for it. I've, I've been to every one of his shows. And another one that I love watching now, it's only recently, is Michael McIntyre, the English um, comedian. I don't know if you've seen him. I don't think I have. Oh, I'll have brilliant. to have a look now. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Observational humour. Just, uh, just simple aspects of life that, you know, people don't realise what they're doing until they see a comedian talking about it. And then they and how realize. funny it is, yeah. So talking about these... Uh, incidental um, areas of life. How did life change when you had your own child? Uh, it changed a lot. Well, before that we had a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Have you still got the dog? Uh, well, no. She, she, That dog died and then we had another dog. That's another, another whole story. But um, uh, of course it changed my life. It was something we, we didn't uh, it didn't happen very quickly with us and we both weren't that young when we married and uh, and the night uh, Daniel was born at the Cabrini Hospital yes it changed my whole life and it was on a Friday night Shabbos morning wow which means I had to walk home <laughs> from Cabrini and I came home and celebrated with the dog with our golden <laughs> retriever I remember um, the two of us sitting there eating Vegemite Chala sandwiches <laughs> together and that was your celebration of your child. Yeah, but then, of course, the bris and the whole thing and uh, the school fees. And <laughs> <laughs> but that, um, were, you, were you ready for how you were going to feel when you saw your son born? Uh, probably not, but it's uh, the most wonderful, wonderful feeling. 
And then as he was growing up, Mm -hmm. because it was a very different experience from when you were growing up and with your dad, you know, even before your bar mitzvah, it was they came from Europe. You were born in Australia. You had were you conscious of the way you were bringing up your son and the things he was able to do that you may not have been able to do or the way you were bringing him up? Well, he was uh, very adept at uh, IT. Really? <laughs> so from I a wasn't. young age? Yes, as most of the young uh, students. In fact, uh, I had a call once from uh, Myers uh, when we were selling to them and um, they wanted to speak to the head of the uh, person in charge of IT, and which I didn't have a clue about. <laughs> so I said, look, I'm sorry he's not home from kindergarten yet. <laughs> Gorgeous, yeah. and um, and he's certainly a child that you're proud of. He's in not just IT but politics. Oh, I'm very proud of him. He's also got a great sense of humour. He actually uh, got uh, distinction in drama in his uh, VCE, and uh, but he never went on to pursue that. He studied uh, urban planning, graduated with honours, which I'm very proud of, and uh, he's quite a political animal. I'm very involved with the Liberal Party. So very much like you in that acting, IT, comedy. Mm, Well, I'm not big in IT. (laughs) But no, but he certainly is diverse in what his interests are. Yeah. And in w- in what he's doing. And he's living overseas at the moment. He's in America at the moment, doing some voluntary work there. And uh, he's tr- trying hard to get into politics over there too, which is his love. He's worked here for um, some uh, shadow ministers in the state government. and So he's had a wealth of experience and yes, living in overseas fact is... In fact, now that the Liberal federal government came in so unexpectedly he's had quite a few job offers to come back but uh, he's determined that he wants to stay in the states and try his luck over there and we give him all the encouragement so you and Adele are going over there on a regular basis we haven't been yet but we will yeah (laughs) we will well Adele I'm sure has been a fabulous partner because she's I've had contact with her both in business and on a social level and she's terrific and the reason that you're here on Lily High on Life today is because I happened to see her in the supermarket and remembered, of course, Robert Will would be a fabulous guest for Lily High on Life. And uh, we really appreciate you being here. Oh, it's been a really enjoyable experience. I hope so, because really your, the, your life has taken different directions. You're a solid, stable human being with a family that you've brought up that's been through quite a number of challenges, which it doesn't sound like it as you breathe through your life but in fact all of those things have made you the solid person who, that you are and a perfect guest for Lily High on Life so thank you for coming and um, thanks for having me Lily and uh, regards to all your listeners thanks for listening